is Dean Taylor with uh, Plug in America. And we're one of the sponsors of this uh, on the steering committee also included Drive Electric Minnesota, Excel Energy and the Sustainable Growth Coalition. Uh, Amy Fedrigal from the Sustainable Growth Coalition will be my co-moderator on this. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Just a reminder, it's a, a Zoom meeting. It's a little bit different than the Zoom webinar. If you have any questions, type into the uh, chat. Uh, you'll all be muted and have your videos turned off until the breakout session. And we're also gonna be recording and having the presentations available both on the Plug in America and the Drive Electric Minnesota websites. Next slide. <clears throat> this was part of a, a six part uh, webinar series. Uh, we're number five in the series. Uh, please go if you're interested in, in stuff on cities and counties or EV 101 or legislation and regulation and executive orders. You can see those from our prior. Also tomorrow at, uh, in, the, in the morning, we're gonna be doing a, a deep dive into policies and best practices for expanding charging in fleets, workplaces, apartments, condos, and public locations. So more, a little more business sector oriented. Next slide, please. We don't have time to go through all of our uh, sponsors that have helped us advertise it, but we have a huge selection of you know, NGOs, utilities, agencies, uh, and uh, private businesses that have been helping. And you'll see even more on the next slide. Again, thank you to all of our partners here. Next slide, please. If you are interested in registering for the uh, upcoming webinar tomorrow, there uh, you'll, you'll go to the uh, Drive Electric Minnesota uh, website or Plug in America website, go to the events and you'll be able to see this. Next slide. Plug in America is uh, a nationwide organization, the voice of the EV drivers. We're founded in 2008. In fact, we go back further than that in some ways back to the who killed the electric car. And uh, we have a, a ton of experience nationwide on with all of the EV drivers around the nation. Our two key areas of focus are policy and advocacy, as well as education and outreach to like dealers and consumers, as well as the uh, National Drive Electric Week and Drive Electric Earth Day. Next slide, please. So our speakers uh, today are, I'll be talking, uh, former commissioner of the MPUC, Dan Lipschultz, uh, Nicholas from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, we're very honored to have Commissioner Steve Grove from the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. Bree uh, uh, Halverson from Blue Green Alliance. Next slide. David Ranallo, Great River Energy, Jim S. Staples, founder of Renewable Energy Partners. And we're very honored to have Deputy Commissioner uh, of the Minnesota Department of Commerce. And of course, I mentioned Amy Fedrigal earlier. She'll be talking and helping us with the breakout sessions. Next slide. So when you go, you can see the bios if you're interested later on, if you go to the website, I'm not gonna spend time on this. Next slide and next slide. So here's our overall agenda. Uh, Commissioner Grove has to leave in 25 minutes. So we've, uh, we'll have him on in just a bit, but I'd like to have uh, former Commissioner Lipschall start by giving a, us an, an introduction to what we're trying to accomplish today. Well, thanks, Dean. Um, we'll see. I think there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of things to accomplish. I just wanted to start out by pointing out a few things. And, you know, last year, EVs represented only a small fraction of new car sales, actually a little less than 2%, and an even smaller percentage of vehicles on the road. Uh, the five best selling cars in, or vehicles in the US were either trucks or SUVs, yet there is no electric truck on the market. And there is only one electric SUV that's remotely affordable to the mass market right now, and that's the new Model Y Tesla. Um, we don't have anything close to the charging infrastructure we need to support EVs. Um, and to top it all off, the vast majority of Americans know next to nothing about EVs and all of their benefits. And so that's an accurate description, really, of the world today as it relates to EVs. And I think then if you're looking in on this, you're probably wondering why we're spending the better part of an afternoon talking about economic opportunities associated with EVs. 
Well, I think the answer is simple. When you're talking about identifying and taking advantage of economic opportunities, it's inherently a forward-looking enterprise. It requires a forward gaze. If you're simply caught looking at the world as it is today, all of the world and its opportunities will probably pass you by. And so it makes sense that we're here today because if you look even at the world today, but you look a layer or two deeper than the description I just gave, you can see where we're going and it's pretty profound. Um, we know two things about electric vehicles today. We know that they're absolutely essential if we're gonna come close to addressing climate change. And a recent M uh, RMI study told us that we're gonna have to get uh, at least 20% uh, of vehicles have to be EVs by 2030. So it, it's quite, there's quite a strong public policy driver there pushing us towards the direction of electric vehicles. And we also know um, as a matter of economics and physics that it's uh, less costly to operate and fuel an electric vehicle compared to an internal combustion vehicle. And as a matter of physics, it's actually far more efficient even today with the battery technology we have than internal combustion gas powered vehicles. Um, and then beyond those two drivers, the economic, the physics, the economics, the physics and, and the environmental pu public policy imperative that are driving us towards EVs, just look at what's happening today uh, and, and really that puts us on the threshold of, of some substantial change in, in the way our transportation sector works. Um, let's think about what the two iconic American automakers are doing. Right now, it doesn't seem to be, uh, they don't seem to be doing very much, but um, Ford Motor Company plans to release an all electric F-150, which by the way, is the most, is the best selling car in the United States today. Um, and they're gonna do that within a year or two. They're also um, within a year going to release under the coveted and, and iconic Mustang brand, an SUV, an all electric SUV. GM is, is really a story worth watching. Um, they are going to invest over $25 billion over the next five years in electric and autonomous vehicles. That's more than they're gonna spend over the next five years on gas powered and diesel vehicles. They plan to release 20 electric vehicles in the next three years. One of them at least probably two will be SUVs with mileage and range of maybe three to 400 miles. Um, and all of the things you're familiar with if you're familiar with Tesla. And, and so I think it's pretty clear where we're going and where we're going here is we're, we're undergoing a fundamental change in an entire industry, transitioning from one technology to another. And with a change like that comes opportunity, economic opportunity. Since the Ford plant closed in St. Paul a number of years ago, Minnesota's participation in the transportation sector in the uh, vehicle industry has been limited really to being consumers of the gas powered vehicles that were built else, elsewhere with, with materials that are developed and, and produced elsewhere as well. This is an opportunity for Minnesota to, uh, uh, to do all sorts of things that we haven't done and participate in a way we haven't before, at least for a long time, in the transportation sector and in the auto industry. And I think that's why we're here today. We're here to talk about those opportunities, some of which we may actually be able to see, some we'll have to imagine, but that's what we need to do if we're gonna take advantage of this opportunity. And again, if you just look at the world the way it is today, or if you try to hold on to the world the way it is today, it will pass you by and all the economic opportunities with it. So with that, I'll stop. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion today and, and looking forward to identifying uh, and, and imagining things that we can do in Minnesota that we haven't done to participate and really take advantage of this sea change in an entire industry. Thanks. Thank you. Our, ne our next speaker is uh, Nicholas. And I apologize because of Commissioner Grove having to leave, I may have to, you know, may have to cut your presentation in half so we give enough time for him to, to, to go on here in a bit. But go ahead, Nicholas. Thank you, thank you, Dean. Thank you, everyone. And um, first of all, let me say thank you for um, inviting me and for having me being part of this uh, this discussion today. Um, let me just start by saying who um, who we are. Um, yeah, so that's um, uh, Bloomberg Energy Finance, where uh, where I work. It's a research organization working at uh, at the intersection of um, of the energy sector and looking at the decarbonization of uh, economies at large, and uh, just a, a very quick overview of uh, of our uh, 
of uh, of our organization. And what I'll do today is talk to you a little bit about the global EV market and uh, with, uh, of course, the, the how the US story fits in all uh, in all that. And by starting, we'll go to to show the sales of uh, yes passenger cars and uh, uh, electric vehicle passenger cars that uh, have grown quite rapidly in the last few years. Uh, there's still a small share of uh, of the total uh, vehicle sales. We expect those to, to end up at about 2.3 million units this uh, year. And there is uh, an uneven distribution. Just to say here that uh, by electric vehicles, we mean battery electrics and uh, plug-in hybrids. And <clears throat> there's an uneven distribution here with uh, China and Europe um, accounting for the bulk of uh, EV sales. And that is because of uh, the policies that are in place in those uh, in those countries. And <clears throat> These uh, and these policies that matter by now are those that target the, the supply side of uh, vehicles, that is the automotive manufacturers, and they mainly take the form of uh, either CO2 emissions or fuel economy targets, and also EV sales mandates in uh, in China, and they are in place in in the largest automotive markets in uh, China, in Europe, and the US. But there is of course uh, a twist in uh, a twist in the US, and uh, we'll see what uh, what that is in a moment, and the effect of those policies is that uh, first of all to say that uh, they actually work and uh, they do what they are meant to, to do. So this is the example of Europe which is quite characteristic of uh, the effect that this policy can have. So the new target in Europe um, <clears throat> came into place in uh, this year in, uh, in 2020 and it is so hard to meet that uh, automotive manufacturers have to introduce electric vehicles in their sales, in their fleet sales, in order to meet those uh, targets and avoid uh, paying paying fines. And that is that's how we that's why we see this uh, rapid acceleration of EV adoption shares of uh, all the major automotive manufacturers that sell in Europe, starting right about the the beginning of uh, of this year. It's a similar situation in China as well, but uh, I won't go into detail uh, a lot in in that one. But uh, the the policy picture in the US is um, um, wasn't that supportive in the last in the last few years. However, the, the president-elect has stressed that he'll push forward more ambitious and stringent fuel economy regulations. And the work that we do shows that uh, these regulations have the potential to have quite a large impact in uh, electric vehicle sales in, in the US to the extent that by 2025 or later, about a quarter of vehicle sales in the US will have to be electric in order to meet these more stringent fuel economy regulations. In the meantime, in the US, uh, purchase subsidies are what um, are the most important policy mechanisms at the moment. These are the federal tax credit and uh, on top of that, the, uh, the, state, uh, the state subsidies. So signpost number one on the electrification story, uh, EV support policies, either implicit or explicit. Next, uh, charge infrastructure, which also has to be in place in order to support the rollout of uh, electric vehicles. And government support can also be important here um, as well. And uh, there are a number of mechanisms, in fact, quite a few mechanisms that governments are already pursuing in order to support uh, electric vehicle sales that uh, they extend from the consumer all the way to the utilities that uh, are supplying the by the, the electricity. Um, so what's the, the global picture on uh, public charges? And these are public charges, just over 1 million public charges installed globally by the first half of this year. Again, the bulk majority of those are in places with high EV sales in Europe and, uh, and, in, and, in, uh, and in China. However, there are positive signs for the US market when we're looking at uh, public charging infrastructure. Uh, utilities, for example, they have had over $3 billion of uh, filings either approved or impending, and uh, that's across a large number of states, so across 20 states or even more. Uh, the majority of those, however, is in, uh, is in California at, uh, at the moment, and they are associated with uh, grid infrastructure but uh, also have some support measures for um, uh, for drivers and uh, organizations. So by the end of this decade at BNEF, we expect just under about 900,000 public charges to be installed in the US, and that would require a cumulative investment of uh, between five and six billion dollars by, by then. So a second signpost being the build out of, uh, of charging uh, infrastructure. And I'm coming now to the most important 
part of the electrification story and that's uh, the global electrification story and that is the battery its technology and uh, its costs and these are the the dots here are uh, observed prices in uh, battery prices in the market and the dotted line is our expectation of uh, future battery prices so battery prices have dropped by about 90 percent since 2010 and we expect those to fall even further in uh, in the 2020s and there are two important numbers to look out in the next few years. The first one is 2024, the second one is $100 per kilowatt hour. And these are important because at that price point and lower, of course, that is where the uh, manufacturing costs of battery electric vehicles start to become the same or similar or even lower than those of equivalent combustion engine vehicles. And that is what, so that's what the, that the time where we're reaching, you know, the upfront cost price parity and which has the potential to kickstart uh, mass consumer demand for, uh, for battery electric vehicles. These price points, of course, will differ according to segment and country and all that, but roughly speaking, as a rule of thumb, that's where we, we expect it to, uh, we expect everything to, to happen around 24, 25, at $100 per kilowatt hour or less. So the third sign to post to, to keep in mind and to, to, to monitor is battery technology and uh, the cost that, uh, that, uh, that, that go into, into making and batteries and uh, putting them in, uh, in cars. And before I, I finish, I, I understand I went a little bit uh, fast here. Let me say that um, electrification, oh yes, by the way, the battery supply chain is, is a whole new story by itself. It's uh, increasing, uh, the scale of the battery manufacturing capacity is increasing so rapidly than that within, the within the next five years, we expect um, four times over as much battery manufacturing, battery cell manufacturing capacity to be online as it is as it was at the at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of this uh, of this year. And uh, a final point before I close has to do with um, the fact that electrification is not only about the passenger cars. There are the passenger cars. There are a number of other. Uh, road transport segments that uh, are either seeing already or will experience very soon uh, the wave of electrification that the passenger transportation is, uh, is, is seeing now. These are buses, of course, electric buses, whose um, economics start to make sense already in some cases. And the second one is uh, commercial vehicles, especially vans and trucks that operate in urban environments within cities. These have uh, in some cases, already their total cost of ownership makes sense to use those instead of uh, equivalent diesel or gasoline uh, vans and trucks. And we expect for, the number of, for a number of reasons that have to do also with uh, uh, support coming from cities and uh, regional support and municipalities to see a, an inflection point in, the, in that segment again in, uh, in, in the next uh, two or three years. So that's not a, a sign post by itself, but uh, these are some very interesting uh, segments to watch where we see a lot of activity and uh, we do expect um, uh, electrification to make uh, inroads in the next in the next few years. And uh, the final thing before I close is uh, by closing is uh, to show your expectations for uh, electri the adoption of electrification in the next uh, couple of decades, in fact, in the different segments of uh, road transport, be it passenger electric vehicles, commercial vehicles, including all uh, vans and trucks of any given weight, and of course, uh, electric buses. In some cases, as electric buses, there's a lot already happening, a lot of that in China, of course. In the other two segments, we see the, the inflection point for passenger electric vehicles coming up relatively soon, if not uh, being here already. And for commercial vehicles, according to the segment, uh, we expect the, at least the economics of these uh, vehicles to, to improve very rapidly in the next, uh, in the next few years. So that is, uh, that is for me. Hopefully I didn't uh, go very fast and uh, uh, great to be here and uh, looking forward to, to, to questions and any discussion following that. Thank you, Nicholas. Don't forget everyone, there's maybe some interesting other opportunities for Minnesota like boats, uh, snowmobiles, planes, lots of interesting different possibilities out there. Um, Amy, can you quickly introduce a commissioner, uh, Grove? Uh, we have about nine minutes, I think, before he has to leave.
You bet. My name is Amy Fredergal, and I'm the Managing Director of the Sustainable Growth Coalition, a program area of environmental initiative. And our mission is to catalyze collaboration across difference to advance social justice and environmental health. The Sustainable Growth Coalition is a corporate sustainability leadership network working to advance the circular economy. And our members include Fortune 500 companies as well as other private and public sector leaders. One thing that we knew when planning this workshop is that we wanted to make sure that we heard from Commissioner Grove. The Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development is led by Commissioner Steve Grove. As Commissioner of the state's principal workforce and development agency, Commissioner Grove brings a wealth of private and public sector experience. He's focused on growing the state's workforce, closing the opportunity gap, and providing businesses with the help they need to thrive. Commissioner Grove was previously an executive at Google. He has launched partnerships in over 50 countries. He previously led YouTube's first news and political teams and help holds a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School. There's much more in his bio in the packet that you heard about earlier. And with that, please help me welcome Commissioner Steve Grove. Great, thanks Amy and thanks Dean and thanks everyone for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is a topic that uh, that I care a lot about. Uh, I lived in Silicon Valley for 15 years before moving back to my home state here of Minnesota a couple of years ago, and during that time transitioned from the private sector to government. But man, when we lived out in, in Menlo Park, it was like every other driveway had a had a Tesla in it or some kind of an electric vehicle, and it was not uncommon to see uh, a driverless vehicle turn the corner and head up your street at any given moment, and so. This is an area that uh, my former employer has obviously invested a lot of time in, uh, Google, and many other startups and, and big companies alike have just embraced this future. And we believe Minnesota does needs to as well. Um, we have some unique advantages in this state when it comes to electric vehicles. Everyone knows about that testing facility up in Baudette that's really world renowned for weather testing. When you think of Minnesota's disadvantage of cold weather, there's some advantages to it too, right? As a, as a proving grounds for testing new technologies in the vehicle space, and I think electric vehicles are no exception. Um, but it also is an area we feel bullish about because of the talent and the industry strength that we have here in our state. You know, we have a tremendous uh, technology industry here, a great IT sector, really strong manufacturing, a great software uh, space, and a really a long history of, of hardware development that uh, dates back to you know, the mid 1950s, where really Minnesota kind of began to become a, a center for the supercomputer industry that has transitioned into a whole host of modern day innovations in, in, uh, in, in med tech and, and several other sectors. So this is an area that we as a department and that the governor is very bullish on, um, both for environmental reasons, of course, but also for economic reasons, because these types of companies, these types of startups, these uh, vehicles from scooters to buses to boats, uh, boats and beyond are going to define the future of transportation. And as a state, we've got to be on top of that to make uh, you know a real difference and and to create great jobs for Minnesotans. I think especially now, and, and just to 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 ground this for a moment in, in the the time that we're living in, we know this has been an incredibly difficult year for our country, uh, certainly for our state. We've lost about three hundred and eighty thousand jobs since this all began, primarily in the service sector industry. We've since gained back about 202,000, so we're, we're up about halfway through and we're, you know, our growth continues. But there's no question that the economy that we have in Minnesota on the other end of this pandemic, it's just going to look a lot different than the economy we had before. And there were already a lot of trend lines uh, at play in, uh, in our economy, certainly in the electric vehicle sector as, as, met, as much as any other, which I think Nicholas really well did a great job of defining. Uh, that we're accelerating trends in our labor market that we want Minnesotans to, to pay attention to and that we think government needs to be on top of. Um, and that has only gotten you know, faster and more important throughout this pandemic. Um, one of the areas that, that we're particularly bullish on is, is the, the role the startup ecosystem can play here. Um, you know, new companies in the American economy account for almost all of the net new job growth. In Minnesota, it's the small businesses and startups that employ almost half of every Minnesotan's or of all the Minnesotans in our state. So um, this is the kind of state where people, um, they not only create companies, but they stick to them. There's a great kind of problem solver mentality in Minnesota, if you will. We have actually the highest business survivability rate of any state in the country. That means that um, if you start a business in the state, you are more likely to be still running that business in five years than you are in any other state in the country. 
Um, and I think that applies to sectors like electric vehicles where, you know, there's a lot of components to this. There's a lot of um, software and hardware and transportation technologies and considerations here. They're gonna take a bunch of different innovations to continue to grow. Um, and we're gonna need that kind of creative energy that Minnesota is, is famous for, um, you know, to build this market up. So, you know, it's gonna take not just businesses and entrepreneurs working hard, but it's gonna take government playing the role that it can. Um, we at Deed uh, are, are really focused on how we can promote uh, the jobs of the future through our investment tools uh, and levers. Um, and certainly our startup ecosystem as well with tax credits and, and a new program that we launched called Launch Minnesota, which specifically focuses on some of the early stage businesses and kind of speeding up that early process of innovation as you're, as you're growing your company. So, um, you know, this is a, a field that uh, a lot of us in government work on. Obviously my colleague, uh, Commissioner Bishop over the MPCA focuses a good deal of time on this, um, as does my colleague, uh, Commissioner Kelleher over at the Department of Transportation. But I think big picture, this is a jobs issue for us. And it's about long-term sustainable quality jobs that, um, that can grow our economy uh, at the same time as improving the environment as, as we've talked about so far. So just wanted to share some of those thoughts. Again, thanks for bringing this group together. What a great uh, series of webinars you've put together and I'm honored to get the chance to, to be a brief part of it. Thank you, Commissioner. And you know, just thinking about all the great innovation opportunities you were teeing up there, I think we perhaps have time for one or two quick questions for you from stakeholders. You know, beyond what you already mentioned, uh, can you talk a little bit more about how your agency is working with companies that are, you know, doing more with EVs in Minnesota or new opportunities the agency might be catalyzing uh, for investment, manufacturing, or other infrastructure opportunities? Yeah. Well, we sit on both the, uh, the Governor's Climate Change Council and on the, the, the Connected and Automated Vehicles uh, group, both of which I think are very much related to the growth of electric vehicles. And, you know, a big part of this is creating the most manufacturing friendly environment we can in the state and leveraging investment dollars to encourage companies that are, that are growing in this space to come to Minnesota and grow and thrive. And so we've got a couple of programs. One's called the Minnesota Investment Fund that invests directly in businesses that wanna grow and stay here. Another is called the Job uh, Creation Fund, which does things uh, similar to the investment fund, but is focused on the number of jobs that a firm can create. Um, and, and again, I think it's, it's that combination of business levers and environmental levers that are gonna make this succeed. You know, one of the things that we have done under Governor Walls in the early days, or feels like early days, it's now been almost two years uh, of his administration, is create something called the Minnesota Business Vitality Council. And this Minnesota Business Vitality Council it's not something that's super public, it's more of an internal thing, but it brings together um, DEED and the Department of Transportation and uh, the Department of Revenue and the Department of Commerce, a bunch of agencies who might otherwise be operating in silos to work together on economic development opportunities that just require a multi-agency approach. And we're just getting started. We did, we did a sprint on hemp recently. We did a sprint on high school uh, tech, continuing techno, technical education to get the kind of manufacturing uh, prowess started early in our high schools. Um, but I think electric ve vehicles could make a good sprint for that group as well as a kind of focused area for government uh, agencies to come together. So uh, a lot more that can be done. And I'd say, as always, we welcome suggestions on what more state government should be doing here. We, we certainly follow what California and others have done and, and, and want to have this state have that same kind of culture of innovation and growth for, uh, for EVs. Well, thank you so much, Commissioner, for all of those really inspiring remarks. It really sets us up for the rest of our webinar. And um, we'll give you a collective virtual applause, and I will pass it back over to Dean. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Dean. We'll see you. Take care. Thanks again for coming. Next slide, Catherine. There we go. So I'm gonna do, uh, the, the next few presentations go get a bit into the weeds, um, but if you could go to the next slide. This is a, a I wanted to do a, a little deeper dive into the literature review uh, to give you some sense about what are the various economic development and jobs studies, macroeconomic studies say about this transition. You know, for example, um, you know, it, there, there'll be some job losses, obviously, in refineries, gas stations, things like that. So do are there net job gains is, is what I'll kind of quickly go over. Next slide. The punchline basically is yes. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different tools, different types of macroeconomic tools you can use. There's 
different state studies, national studies, studies from other continents, and they all are saying that there's huge net economic development or gross state product and job gains, you know, to be had here. And we'll go a little bit more into the reason why. But uh, and these are all very recent studies. I'll just really kind of skim over them rather quickly. One is a, a ICF report from a year ago that looked at all the different electric trucks and buses uh, to to completely electrify the, the sector out to 2050, comparing it to natural gas and diesel and found the, that were net job benefits there. The uh, <clears throat> NREL also did a study nationwide back about four years ago, looking at light duty electric cars found the same thing. Uh, and they uh, did also some deep dives in nine you know, US regions on the macro and economic and jobs benefits. Next slide. Environmental entrepreneurs uh, did a recent study. It's not economic, macroeconomic, but it does estimate the total current uh, jobs uh, available nationally uh, from both light, medium, and heavy duty EVs. The uh, big study by the European Association of Electrical Contractors you know, did a deep dive and found that it could create twice as many new jobs as the number of them being lost due to the in internal combustion engine. Next slide. <clears throat> California Air Resources Board uh, loves to do mandates on electric vehicles. Well, what you may not know is they have to do a detailed macroeconomic assessment in order to justify their regulations. And so there's at least five of those where they've gone and done this very detailed assessment and, and they've shown uh, positive uh, gross state product and jobs benefits. Southern California Edison did a pretty interesting study using the pathways model going showing that there's, uh, it's the most economical way to decarbonize the California economy. Uh, and it looked more broadly than just EVs to also include energy efficiency, building and electrification, uh, renewable fuels for, for power plants and low carbon fuels for hard to electrify sectors and compared many different options found this was the best. Next slide. Another study was uh, worth mentioning is a nationwide study by ERA, which looked at electric forklifts, truck stop electrification, and ships that plug in uh, called shore power, as well as electric buses. And they also did deep dives in New York, Ohio, and Florida. And also for these more niche type vehicles, same thing. Next study was done very recently in the last few months by the um, called Building Back Better for Washington State. And they found 10.7 jobs per million dollar investment, which was uh, the second best out of the five categories that they looked at, you know, such as low carbon agriculture, et cetera. Next slide. The um, Advanced Energy Economy in May did a, a, a deep dive in Pennsylvania and concluded that more than 350 Pennsylvania firms could easily transition to supply in the, the uh, supply chain for EVs. Berkeley did a, a UC Berkeley did a report for Next Chan about a year ago, similarly looking at the at the microeconomic and jobs impacts. Sierra Club's millions of good jobs found over one million jobs per year nationally, including over 128,000 manufacturing gear jobs possible with electric transportation. You know, obviously I have links in this uh, deck to all these studies if you want them later. <clears throat> Next slide. The studies did get into the issue of job quality. I don't think we have time to do this, but basically when you compare how many jobs per million dollars at like a refinery versus how many jobs you get from either manufacturing of EVs or the, the jobs from uh, a um, installation of infrastructure, there's just a lot more jobs available per million dollars invested. That's a major reason why, and they tend to be very you know good, uh, reasonably high paying jobs. Next slide. <clears throat> For those interested in disadvantaged communities, not all, but at least a few of the studies I mentioned dive into that. So they found, you know, subs you know, a lot depends on how well you design the program in the in the first place. But um, they were finding even more benefits in low income and disadvantaged community regions just because of the the various nature of the jobs or the design of the program or both. Next slide. So this is a little weedy here. Most of the studies use a macroeconomic model called implan, but 
you know, what I found interesting is there's a lot of other models used by some of the, the, them, including uh, the Resolve model, EDRAM, BEAR, REMI, that we're doing the macroeconomic or some of the other things. Um, also in the appendix, I don't have time to go over, there, there'll be links to a whole bunch of other policy studies associated with uh, good policies associated with TE adoption. And certainly our other webinars go into that a lot. And we have a model policy toolkit that we've done with others, version 4.0. And you know, there's links to that, I think, maybe later on in this deck or in uh, some of our other presentations. Next slide. The conclusion is essentially, you know, whether it's cars, trucks, buses, non-road equipment, it's a, electrification is a net producer of jobs and growth state product. It is shown for many different regions, many different models. The more money stays in the local econ economy instead of going to Saudi Arabia or other foreign places. And there's many more quality jobs created than what is lost. And there's obviously a tremendous, you know, opportunity uh, and what Nicholas really didn't have a chance to say is just huge amounts of money just in the last year, like roughly 60 billion invested in Europe, 20 billion in China. The whole industry is going through massive change and there's really a rather narrow window to act uh, for Minnesota to take advantage. Because as Dan said, this is all very future looking. If you want to get involved, maybe pick a niche like snowmobiles or planes or boats or some other you know, aspect, there's plenty of opportunity. And certainly I've been looking around, there's other states like Alabama or Ohio that are leaders in this front of being really hungry and attracting these manufacturing jobs. Next slide. Thank you very much. I'm going to move to our next speaker is Bree Halverson with the Blue Green Alliance, which is a really interesting organization that combines environmental groups and unions. So go ahead, please go ahead, Bree. Well, um, thank you. And I feel like all of the speakers really set me up uh, to talk about this stuff. So that's awesome. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is, uh, like I said, Bree Halverson. I've been doing policy work for what feels like a really long time now, uh, but predominantly um, in the labor movement um, around uh, wage and hour and other uh, sort of uh, pro-worker policies uh, throughout my career. So next slide. Um, this is the Blue Green Alliance. So uh, like Dean said, we are a coalition of unions and environmental organizations. We were started by the United Steelworkers, which is our largest manufacturing union here in Minnesota. So um, they manufacture uh, paper and they mine taconite. And, um, and even though they do a lot of mining, they also have healthcare workers. And then we were also started by the Sierra Club. So. Um, and then we were able to grow to uh, some of the nation's largest and most influential unions and environmental organizations. So um, we're pretty excited about uh, the coalition that we've built over the years. So next slide, please. Um, so um, why are we here today? Well, we at the Blue Green Alliance have been working in a lot of different sort of, um, you know, areas with the understanding that workers um, don't really have to choose between a good job and a clean environment. We believe that um, this is a false choice and that um, if we are just sort of proactive, um, we can have both. And so in 2019, knowing that we were coming up on 2020, we put together a Solidarity for Climate Action um, platform and um, released that in 2020. And I would recommend you go to our website to check it out. It's more than just manufacturing. Um, it's um, just sort of our philosophy on a lot of things. But that led into a manufacturing agenda. And we are very lucky at the Blue Green Alliance to have Zoe Lipman, who is um, an expert uh, in this field of thinking about how to have um, really sort of clean energy manufacturing um, here in the United States, um, making sure that we're maintaining and growing that. And so we, this summer, released a manufacturing agenda. That's big for a federal level, but we're hoping to figure out how to work with people like you to adapt it on um, a state level. Um, and especially with what Commissioner Grove said, um, definitely excited to figure out how to work with DEED on making sure that we've got a Minnesota manufacturing agenda. So. Um, and then, like everyone, um, you know, COVID um, really sort of highlighted a lot of 
uh, things for, I think, a lot of people and knowing that um, our economy has taken a hit, especially in the service sector, um, that we're going to need to go into um, just thinking about recovery. And as sort of we're going into recovery and thinking about how to get our manufacturing or get our economy back up and running, like where are the investments that we can be just really mindful of um, uh, to actually invest in our manufacturing sector. And so um, we have a few things on our website that we're thinking, but we think that our manufacturing agenda can really help sort of uh, prioritize, I think, some of the places that we think will be helpful. So next slide, please. <laughs> so um, we also, what a lot of people don't know about the Blue Green Alliance, we have a really great research team um, based here in um, Minneapolis. So they, for years, have been working on a database. Um, and this is a slide from uh, that database that we have around vehicles. And so uh, this is a map. You can kind of look at uh, different types of vehicles. Some are combustion engines, some are EV, anything from also railroad and um, buses. And you can kind of look at the infrastructure of manufacturing we have across the country. So it's not just assembly, but also like where are those parts? Parts, uh, made. So Minnesota, even though we aren't an assembly state anymore because of the Ford plant leaving, we still manufacture different component parts. Um, and, you know, if you're interested, you can go on it. It's an interactive website. You can go and look. And so I think it's really important to show that um, the, this map because we do have a really good manufacturing infrastructure. And so as we're thinking about policy, we can figure out how to like utilize what we already have to um, grow manufacturers and grow jobs here. Um, and also possibly have um, spin-off supply chain industries that come out of that. So next slide, please. So, we want to have a proactive agenda at Blue Green Alliance, uh, really thinking about the future. I think Dean did a really good job about talking about the fact that there is this window and that everybody wants to make sure that they are creating good jobs in their state. And um, Minnesota actually has some really good, um, you know, infrastructure that um, for sort of corporate responsibility and corporate investment. And so these are some of the pillars of what we think are important. Um, using all of the toolboxes in the tools in the toolbox we can, and especially with public spending and deploy incentives wisely. And this can come from um, anything from, you know, how we want to do programs for investment and thinking about investment in technology. Like we have really great universities here. And so um, when they develop something, where, where are those ideas manufactured and what is the investment we wanna do to actually see if we can invest that here from an idea that sparked at one of our great universities. But also, there's also private investment too. Um, I you know, want to point out that um, a lot of our unionized workforce, uh, especially in the manufacturing, has been using their contracts to work with their employers to think through how um, they can be part of the solution of taking their manufacturing to the next level or thinking about how their company is actually meeting the goals that they set out in public. I'd like to, you know, just point to like UPS is working with their um their organized workers um, at their work site to think through how to like electrify that fleet and what is the infrastructure that they're going to need to have for UPS and what are what's the uh, steps that they can take to do that. And so, um, so those are just also some other tools. Um, um, and also when you have the workforce engaged in some of these decisions um, and thinking it uh, thinking through what the next steps are. That also ensures, I think, fairness, um, thinking through what kind of jobs, where they are, and who should be, who should uh, get those jobs. So next slide, please. So um, like I said, public investment, we want to make sure that we're doing it right. Um, you know, thinking, and we also need to think about, you know, um, the high, oh, that's fine. <laughs> you can go to this slide. Um, we, um, want to also think about um, the quality of the jobs. So I think Dean touched on the fact that we could have um, high quality jobs. I just also want to make sure that that needs to be a conscious effort, right? Um, that when we're thinking through on policy, we need to be really mindful of um, 
where these jobs um, actually get developed, who gets these jobs, and what sort of supporting policies need to be in place um, for um, those to be good family sustaining jobs um, uh, as they get developed. So next slide. Um, I think it's always important when you're talking about just sort of a big national agenda and all of these ideas to give people um, a tangible uh, sort of Minnesota example of something that could happen. So um, it didn't happen during this last administration, but the very tail end of the Obama administration, um, the U.S. Transportation Department passed the U.S. Employment Plan. And so it was a sort of matrix um, on a federal level of, you know, how um, transportation dollars could be utilized a little bit better. And it was different sort of points uh, that companies could get um, uh, to sort of prop up their product a little bit better because they hit some sort of um, ideas that they thought would be good for spending of federal taxpayer dollars. Um, one of those was making sure that if money was spent, uh, if they were going to give federal dollars to the, you know, Chicago Transit Authority or the LA Transit Authority, right, that um, they made sure that there was a certain percentage of the workers that were hired locally. Um, and so that really then helped um, some of these um, uh, you know, transit authorities pass a similar policy uh, where they would say that when we put out the RFP, we want to make sure that X percent of uh, your workforce is hired X, uh, locally, X percent has health care or, or what have you. Sort of pretty standard procurement, um, you know, language. Um, and so the Metropolitan Council here in Minnesota actually did adopt um, a U.S. employment plan like um, procurement um, policy. And um, what that ended up doing is helping um, helping sort of new flyer um, that produces buses in St. Cloud and Crookston um, actually um, get a bid at our Metropolitan Council because they have local workers within a certain range, right? St. Cloud, obviously Crookston might be a little farther from, from our Metro, but um, you know, it really then sort of secured a manufacturer here in an area with um, a diverse um, group of workers and in an area that could really use the jobs. So um, thinking through about how to pair some of these policies along with some of the really great economic development stuff that's going on in Minnesota, um, I think is a really good way to make sure that we are creating good family sustaining jobs um, and uh, here in Minnesota. So last slide. Thank you. Thank you. Our, ne our next speaker is uh, David Renawa with uh, Great River Energy, and he's speaking on opportunities in greater Minnesota. And <clears throat> we are running behind, so maybe you could keep <clears throat> off a couple minutes, if, if at all possible. Thank you. Go ahead, David. Can you hear me? Thumbs up, if you can hear yep. me. Yes. Awesome. OK. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, you're right, I'm with Great River Energy, and I just have to tell a quick story that I've told some of you to kick it off because a couple years ago, my son was looking out the window, staring over the horizon, um, trying to spot Santa and his reindeer, and he looked up at me in deep thought and said, Dad, is Santa's sleigh magic or is it electric? And, you know, I knew right then I have way too much influence on the kid, but also um, that <clears throat> he's on the right track. So anyway, with that, next slide, please. Great River Energy serves um, 28 member owners throughout the state of Minnesota, and really we are strong because our members are strong. We're not-for-profit wholesale generation and transmission cooperative that really, you know, we have some suburban areas, but mostly rural in the state, so we have a lot of uh, different, different diverse end-use members. And it's about 700,000 homes, businesses, and farms, or about 1.7 million people that those 28 members serve. Next slide. Like I mentioned, we are a cooperative. So economic development is absolutely part of our DNA. Um, we adhere to the cooperative principles, one of which is concern for community. So you can kind of see on the slide where that focus is and where our economic de development activities fall. But paramount to all of this is relationships with both our member owners and the members they serve that I mentioned earlier. Next slide. We certainly consider electric and specifically electric vehicles or transportation electrification. 
we consider these a quadruple win for the areas that we serve. Number one, it grows our business, but also it's a win for the environment, for the local economy and keeping money local, but as well as our member consumer pocketbooks with the cost effectiveness that EVs are. Um, when we talk about EVs, you'll see there I've listed four focus areas that we, we consider important to help stimulate the market in these parts of Minnesota. Uh, top of it all is awareness. We think that the biggest barrier is folks just not knowing that an electric vehicle is a viable option for them. Um, also infrastructure, you need to see it, it needs to be there, and there needs to be ways to charge so that the load curve um, is, is good, that we don't have a growth gone wrong scenario. Retail solutions, and this is demystifying the process of buying and fueling and owning an electric vehicle. And then finally, commercial and industrial applications. Next slide. Part of the awareness is having events where folks can kick the tires and see these cars and in, in, in end use technologies in action. So last year, our members held over 20 ride and drives throughout the state. Um, we were happy to be a sponsor of the first ever electric room at the Twin Cities Auto Show in partnership with the Dealers Association. We have lots of EV show and tells. We have presence at the Minnesota State Fair and basically we go by Yuka's phrase, which is if there's a party, we'll be there when it's, when it's to do with electric to show consumers what EVs actually look like and, and how they feel to get behind the wheel. Next slide, please. Um, infrastructure is certainly an important piece of the equation and the economic development standpoint. Um, currently, electric cooperatives in Minnesota uh, that are GRE members have taken part in over 75 public chargers throughout the state of Minnesota. And these are level twos and DC fast chargers. We're also launching a DC fast charger pilot wholesale rate to our members so that they can encourage and support the business, but still recover the cost that the, the standard service rate doesn't always allow for. And we're always looking for partnerships here where we can collaborate and help build communities. I think there's a lot of potential there with, with the infrastructure piece. Next slide. Uh, we're very proud to be one of the first utilities that we know of in the country to launch a renewable wind energy program specifically aligned with our members' uses of electric vehicles. Uh, over four years ago, connecting wind energy uh, for all of the electricity used for an electric vehicle for the lifetime of that electric vehicle at no additional cost. Uh, that program is called Revolt and still exists today. Next. Uh, I talked about retail solutions and more recently our members uh, with GRE launched an EVSE one-stop promotion where really, you know, and it, it kind of started in a strategic planning session, but then uh, one of our marketing folks was on Facebook and saw on the Minnesota Plug-in Electric Vehicle Owners Group that someone had asked, I'm getting an EV, um, <clears throat> what charger should I put in my garage? And within, you know, an hour or two, there were like 300 responses, all different and all good. And it was like, okay, here's where we can help play a role as a utility and educate our member consumers. You know, it's really not rocket science and take some of the guesswork out. So we launched this promotion to sort of Amazonianize infrastructure within garages. We serve primarily residential. Um, so, you know, a click later, they can end up with a charger on their doorstep uh, in a, within a week and uh, also be hooked up with a certified electrician that works with the electric co-op and enroll in load management programs and just make it really easy. We only have three chargers. We partnered with Zeph Energy, uh, a local infrastructure expert, and it's been awesome. You know, we've been about a year into this promotion. We will continue it for a while and get a lot of data on the back end. Next slide. Finally, I mentioned awareness again, and it's so important to, to show our member consumers that electric vehicles can travel. They're not just for the downtown metro area. And so to celebrate the electric corridors in the state that our members played a part in, you know, a couple of years ago, it was the I-35 corridor to go from the Twin Cities to the North Shore, back again and in between. And more recently, as part of the M to M larger electric corridor from Michigan to Montana, we're highlighting the 94 corridor with different promotions state park charger partnerships and, and other um, ways to raise awareness. Next. I think this whole range anxiety thing is really real. You know, I'm talking to a lot of you folks who we know that you can go far with an EV, but this is still a major concern for consumers. And the more we can do to educate and spread awareness, I think there's also economic development opportunities here with retail partnerships and, and different promotions with chargers at businesses. 
Next slide. We were also proud to be a partner with Schmidt and Sons to bring the, the Midwest's first battery electric school bus to the state uh, as a pilot in 2017-2018 school year. Uh, it was designed to study the economic and emissions benefits of the bus, as well as demonstrate battery electric technology and that it really works here in Minnesota, even where it's cold and in co-op land where there's longer, more suburban routes. So uh, before COVID, this bus traveled 81 miles a day with 98 planned stops, fully recharged overnight, has over um, one and a half kilowatt hours a mile, about 10 cents a mile less in fuel costs than its diesel counterpart. And you know, when you take into account the average 260 miles or 260 hours of idle time that a diesel bus has each year, far less emissions from the start and just in terms of idling. Next slide and my last slide. We also try to provide opportunities and programs for our commercial and industrial members. Um, most recently, Rodney and our team launched a try before you buy electric forklift trial. Um, we've had four co-ops take part into this awesome if, if you know commercial and industrial looks into the benefits both in safety and economics for an electric forklift this is pretty simple they try it um, we've had a 50 percent conversion rate so far and we have rebates and, and programs around that so thank you so much for your time today um, the future is bright and certainly electric appreciate it great you know thank you so much david uh, our next speaker is Jamez Staples, founder of Renewable Energy Partners. Uh, and same admonition to you, we you may have to skip a few slides. We're probably over 10 minutes behind. Thank you. Sure, um, so thank you all for having me. Uh, Jamez Staples, uh, founder of principal, next slide please, I'm sorry. Founder of principal of Renewable Energy Partners in Northgate Development. Um, you know, my personal mission is empowering the community while improving the environment. Next slide, please. Uh, Renewable Energy Partners, we are, uh, our mission is to address climate change and poverty at the same time. Uh, we are a solar installation company as well as an uh, uh, installer. We are, the, in the background, you see a project that's actually a project taking place right now, one of our impact projects, North High School Community Solar Garden, which will be a low-income community solar garden where uh, residents will have the ability to subscribe with no money down as well as bypassing any required credit checks. Uh, we also are doing a microgrid project, which will be on three Minneapolis public schools project, uh, I'm sorry, buildings, and they, uh, uh, where we're partnering with Siemens to uh, develop this microgrid, and, and we're, we're emphasizing the idea of community ownership. Next slide, please. Uh, Northgate Development is a uh, real estate company, um, where it's a holding company for our real estate, and we're positioning the community for uh, success through the East Plymouth Innovation Corridor, and the East Plymouth Innovation Corridor is focused on innovation. So electric vehicles clearly mean some of the newest stuff that's coming about. We wanna make sure that we're uh, developing the infrastructure with solar, microgrids, uh, stormwater management, and all the other necessary components to address climate change. And uh, the EPIC project, the East Plymouth Innovation Corridor, starting with the Regional Apprenticeship Training Center, which we are focused on bringing the necessary skill sets and educational opportunities for community members as well as uh, students to engage in the, in the uh, future emerging sectors of the economy. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Trying to keep you guys on track here. So North Minneapolis, uh, for those of you that don't know, is an economic challenge community. You may hear about it on the news because of some of the issues that we've been having. I'm a resident um, and an intentional resident. And as you can notice here by the data, data sets that are uh, identified, you know, the, 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 rate, the racial disparities here in Minnesota are deep and rampant, and it's very disappointing that we actually still have these as, as uh, um, mechanisms that we have to, have to contend with. But we are at Renewable Energy Partners focused on trying to do the good work of the, of the community as well as the, the uh, sustainability, sustainable community. Um, you can see data points which are just absolutely horrific. We don't need to go into detail, but you all see them, so you can study them later. Next slide, please. And what I'm here to say is that Northsiders deserve the workforce opportunities also uh, for these emerging sectors. Uh, we have a huge opportunity with the uh, population that we have. There's a, there's a substantial level of uh, unemployed and underemployed individuals. We have uh, some of the, um, as you can see again, data sets uh, that will show that we have a very, very high growth rate in terms of uh, individuals that are 17 years and, and younger 
um, and individuals that don't necessarily have the skill, don't have high school degrees, which we can utilize uh, to get them into these emerging sectors. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So these facts, I'm sure you all already know, um, but what we want to do is um, take into consideration that this is, again, an emerging sector. When uh, Dean made some comments about the idea that, you know, uh, lower income communities and economically challenged areas um, <clears throat> have opportunities, you know, I would love to do a deeper dive into that. Unfortunately, I couldn't find much information that justified the existence, but we know that these folks need uh, opportunities. And we see that Excel is proposing 22 million in EV rebates. What I'm suggesting is that we need to figure out how to, to, to uh, target those lower income individuals because they drive some of the most inefficient vehicles. We need, I mean, I don't really see everybody that I've seen in any of these pictures has been look like they're pretty well off. And I think that it's important that we find a way to make sure that these, these, uh, these benefits trickle down to, to some of these people, these communities. Thank you, uh, next slide, please. So Renewable Energy Partners and Northgate Development is leading the charge to help address these issues of environmental justice tied to economic, economic prosperity. Um, we are uh, the training center, which is the, the regional apprenticeship training center, which in the backdrop you see is a rendering of the building. We have installed the 160 some kilowatts of solar system on the roof. We have a stormwater management system on site. We are installing uh, the electric vehicle charging station, the Zeph Energy Charger on site. Uh, we, we have uh, created curriculum for the Minneapolis public schools uh, for, their day, for their adult basic education. We are partnering with Zeph uh, on the Minneapolis and St. Paul Metro Ability Hubs. And we are uh, focused on the idea of like starting to, do, starting to set the stage for where people along uh, in these communities can have access to the uh, skill sets and training. Um, the training center sits on the highest used transit line in the state of Minnesota. Uh, which is the five bus line, which is scheduled for a bus rapid transit improvement, which we hope to have uh, from the Metropolitan Council and electric, electric buses going uh, up, and down the, up and down the road. Uh, the D line will go from Brooklyn Center all the way to Bloomington. And in between there, there's um, very close because I catch the train. I'm sorry, I catch the bus and I catch the train when I go to the airport. And you can basically walk basic, uh, one block at the twin station uh, to, to the twin stadium off the, off the five bus line to get to the train. And what I'm saying is, 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 is we need to do a better job of engaging younger populations to engage in some of these emerging sectors. All of us that I've, I mean, I can't see everybody, but the people that I have seen that are on the, on the screen look like we're all at least 35 and over. And I think that we can do a better job of engaging the younger populations and showing them that there are opportunities that are that one, because the generation Z's and, and whatever the next generation is, um, they need to know that these things are out there and they're, they're pushing for it in terms of their desires to do work that means something and that, 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 that has multiple benefits. So I, I just say to all of you uh, in this space here, let's, let's, let's be more mindful about the people that we're engaging and let's try and find ways to reach down and create pathways and opportunities. Uh, next slide, please. That's again, the rendering of the training center. Thank you. Uh, my contact information is, is attached below. If you have any questions for me, feel free to reach out. I think I did pretty good for you, Dean. Yeah, thank you so much, Jamez. And we're honored to have our last speaker is Deputy Commissioner uh, Adi Ranadi of the <clears throat> Department of Commerce in Minnesota. Go to the next slide, please, Catherine. Great, thank, uh, thank you, thank you, Dean and Amy, for this uh, opportunity. So, I'll, I'll say a few words about Commerce's uh, involvement in uh, transportation electrification, um, and um, maybe I'll cover some of the less covered areas. Just want to show the breadth of uh, economic activity already underway in 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 the uh, in in the state from these various entities. So uh, commerce, of course, like DEED, is part of the climate change sub-cabinet. Um, and uh, as part of that, we participate in the, in the transportation working group. Uh, of course, I should point, uh, point out here that EVs are only as clean as uh, uh, the underlying electric grid. So we play a large role in um, decarbonization of uh, of the of the power grid through our legislative and uh, regulatory activities um, so um, at, at a high level Minnesota 
spends about eleven billion dollars per year on transportation fuel. So you know the the, the simple math is that if and almost all of it uh, out of state. Um, so if we were to divert some of that um, in, in into the state, uh, it it makes it makes a lot of sense uh, from an economic growth perspective. Um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a statewide study, but a uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation um, and University of Minnesota uh, small study indicates that if 150 chargers were installed, about 50 kilowatt, 150 kilowatt, uh, it would create about 80 jobs and about $14 million of uh, economic activity. So. If Minnesota were to have as many chargers as California, which is about 20,000, we'd be able to create 10, 11,000 jobs. So it's it's significant. Um, so um, in addition to the cold weather testing, um, which I'm not mentioning here, there are obviously um, uh, economic, uh, increased economic activity just because of increased load uh, on, on the power utility side. Um, Jamez mentioned uh, Zef, uh, Zef Energy uh, and uh, their charging products. Uh, but in addition to the charging products, uh, there is an opportunity for a network software to manage a fleet of charging stations uh, for different goals, uh, right? Uh, how many uh, EV drivers did you serve, right? A particular set of charging stations or um, uh, how much greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, savings were achieved. So the OATI software platform for char charging station network management is called Evolution. It does uh, just that. Uh, and then some of the lesser known uh, areas here, um, you might be surprised to see the name Tesla here, but Tesla in 2017 acquired a manufacturing automation company uh, called Perbix, uh, which is located in Brook Brooklyn Park. Uh, and Perbix's uh, specialty is assembly line uh, automation. So uh, again, as uh, Commissioner Grove was, uh, was mentioning our expertise in uh, manufacturing uh, innovation uh, is, is, is recognized right by uh, the leading player in this, uh, in this space. Uh, and then, uh, one of the more unexpected areas for uh, technological innovation and economic activity is uh, the need for new permanent magnet materials. Um, electric vehicles, of course, as we all as we all know, have a large battery. That's why they also need a large motor, and that necessitates uh, permanent magnets, uh, and which are you know often uh, conventionally rare earth uh, materials like uh, neodymium. Um, so there is a significant interest and effort underway to find new materials. And um, a real great success story here is uh, Professor Peng Wang at uh, University of Minnesota uh, started his research uh, in a new iron nitride uh, materials uh, in 2013-14 timeframe received a $4 million DOE grant, and now um, has spun a company called Nyron Magnetics. Um, uh, from that, I'm sorry, that logo is missing here, Nyron Magnetics. So Nyron Magnetics this year received additional funding from DOE and signed a collaboration agreement with uh, General Motors uh, for to develop permanent magnet materials for electric vehicles. So my, my message is, even if we just look at the charging stations, we can create uh, a lot of jobs. And if you look in uh, in totality uh, across factory automation, software, uh, new materials for uh, motors, uh, I think um, uh, the state as a whole has uh, a great opportunity, not only to create jobs for uh, EV charging uh, installation and the increased load in the state, but to develop technologies that can serve the, the market nationally and, and globally across all these areas. So, so commerce is excited to be to be part of uh, part of this as 
uh, you know, as a regulator of electrical utilities, uh, as well as uh, in its role as a, a convener uh, and um, uh, advisor to the administration. Thank you so much, uh, Adi. We had a great conversation. So now I'd like to ask the facilitators of each Zoom room to share maybe one or two nuggets quickly as we're wrapping up here. So who would like to start? Well, I'll start just, just quickly. Um, you know, I, one of the comments was just how um, amazed folks were at the broad kind of, at the breadth of participation and interest um, in EVs and the spin-off and the economic opportunities for, from EVs. And, and that was one thing we discussed. Um, talked about maybe the need to focus on mass transit and the opportunities there, uh, not just for consumers, but uh, potentially in the manufacturing space. We have a bus company, electric bus company, New Flyer. And I think a lot of the component parts are built here, in software in Minnesota by Minnesota companies. Um, and um, so there's just, um, you know, one of the thoughts and comments that came up was an amazement at how much auto companies are now investing in EVs uh, relative to the lack of demand for EVs. And, and our thought was, well, you know, if you want to know where we're going, follow the money. Uh, these folks aren't dumb and, 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 and iconic automakers like GM and Ford are very conservative. If they're putting that kind of money into electric vehicles, that tells us something about where we're going. And, uh, and the opportunities are, I think, something that needs to be, dis need to be discussed a lot more. And, and that, in a nutshell, is kind of what we talked about. Great. Amy, uh, group, oh, go sorry, go ahead. A group four mostly talked about equity in terms of infrastructure and, you know, um, being an electric co-op, we served a lot of rural Minnesota and uh, lower income eligible type counties with the highest rates of, of low income. You know, infrastructure needs to follow and be equal for all. And so we talked a bit about that and how the secondary EV market could play a part in affordability as we know the cost of ownership overall with EVs is lower throughout their lifetime. And then just one other nugget, we talked a little bit about it. could Minnesota own some kind of niche market? You know, we are the land of 10,000 lakes, we have snow. Is there room to expand the boating and snowmobile and ATV market and really uh, stand out in something unique? So thanks to our group. This is uh, Dean. Uh, I give a shout out to Representative Steve Elkin for joining us on so many of our various webinars. I really appreciate you you joining and staying for all of them. Um, I did want to say on our, our group really did talk about maybe being more aggressive regarding going and getting you know, manufacturing jobs like some of the other states have really aggressive outreach efforts to get jobs to their state. <laughs> Probably more could be done. We talked about an overlay program, I think it's done in energy conservation and stuff where both utilities and state government have equity requirements that they have to, you know, meet for disadvantaged rural tribal, you know, communities. And then we also talked a little bit about uh, like rural tourism to get more um, ability to, to take advantage of EVs going to the 10,000 lakes. Thanks, Dean. How about Jamez? Oh, I, I, no, I was, I was in danger. Okay, I thought, you, I thought you unmuted. Okay, no, oh, no, no problem. Yeah, I, I would say one thing I thought was, was key was that I think we should uh, look at the SIP program as a way to uh, help develop some of this infrastructure and then also support some of the, the, the uh, job programs as well as workforce training, as well as, um, you know, the infrastructure pieces that are going to be necessary to draw some of the manufacturers here. So just one of the things, but Dean did a great job. Yeah, I'll build on our group, uh, had a great conversation. We talked about the infrastructure role, especially for the state and things that we can do in the community development realm. We had a lot of cities represented in our group and we talked about environmental justice and how one thing that we hadn't talked so much earlier in the hour was the environmental justice and air quality angle. If you live in certain zip codes, you uh, breathe worse air uh, and drink worse water. And so those are some angles that we wanted to pull out as well. See, who did I miss? Me. Uh, so Nicholas and I, um, so if I forget anything, pop in. Real quick, we um, talked about um, just a different kind of financing, like maybe even though PACE isn't for residential, like PACE type or on-bill financing, how can that be utilized? Um, also just like, you know, thinking about sort of like how to do commercial vehicle program for small businesses, like thinking around fleets, like they aren't really kind of in the mix and how do you pull them into uh, the mix around sort of um, smaller businesses. Um, 
Representative Elkins brought up job training and how to think through sort of like who needs to be trained and what type of training they need to either maintain some of these vehicles or, you know, build some of these vehicles. And then what are some of the, um, you know, sort of like ancillary uh, sort of manufacturing that comes out of like batteries. Um, and so thinking through what um, can come out of that, like um, software or um, um, big machines that are manufactured to make these things and things like that. Did I miss lot, anything? A lot. <laughs> so much creativity. Great. I think we got everyone. And in the interest of time, I just want to thank you all for sharing those thoughts and charging us up. There's so many great puns in the electric vehicle world. Um, charging up this conversation, I am going to pass it off to Dean for our closing. I hope you all enjoyed today. Uh, please join us you know, tomorrow or go look at some of the others. Give some of the thoughts to us as well as Drive Electric Minnesota if you have any great ideas for legislation or executive orders or other things so that this just doesn't become uh, something that sits on the shelf but turns into some real action. Uh, maybe with Representative Elkins will we'll, we'll want to do some bills since he's been uh, coming to all of our <laughs> events. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, I, um, Representative Long, who is one of the present presenters this morning, um, sits, uh, uh, his office is literally right next door to mine in the state office building. Uh, neither of us are spending much time there these days, but uh, um, certainly Jamie is uh, our leader um, in, uh, on energy policy. He's actually going to be the incoming chair of the Energy Committee in the House this year. Uh, I expect to still be uh, serving uh, in the, on the House Transportation Committee. So, um, and then uh, I'll be serving with, uh, I hope to be her serving again with uh, Zach uh, Stevenson, who is the, the incoming chair of our Commerce Committee. I served on that committee last time and hoping to serve on that one is again. again. So um, the three of them, uh, plus Patty Acum from uh, uh, Minnetonka, who is the uh, head of our uh, Clean Energy Caucus um, as well. So there are a bunch of us who will be working very actively in, in this area. And Zach and, and Jamie had bills last year. I've got the uh, low user charge bill th th this year. And so I, I, there's, there's a bunch of us who will be working very actively on this issue. Very good. Thank you. Brendan, you're the um, lead facilitator for Minnesota, for Drive Electric Minnesota, do you want to say anything uh, about next year? Well, I, I just, this has been a fantastic, uh, and, and you know, I, I so many of us attend a lot of EV related events and, uh, you know, occasionally I go to somewhere, I hear this stuff again that I, but this is not the case today. I learned some new things from the conversation today uh, and uh, some things I didn't even know about going on right here, here in our state. So what a great group. And I really appreciate everybody, uh, everybody who took part and uh, shared their knowledge. Great. Well, thank you all. We've gone six minutes over. I really appreciate everybody attending today.